Good morning, everyone. Just really glad you are joining us this morning. I know there are still more still connecting. Welcome. It's good that we can gather together via Facebook Live. Very appreciative, appreciative of your support and prayers. We had good news this week all around. Many of us had some good, good news this week. We're here to worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To rem remember how much he loves us. To recall to mind what he is doing, what he has done, and what he will yet do in our lives. To present to him and give to him all of our worries and concerns and burdens. That he might give to us the peace of Christ which passes all understanding. I hope you've had a good week. It's been a busy week for me. I, it was an enjoyable week. Again, welcome. Let's pray. Kind and merciful Father, I again thank you for this day, for life, for family, for the body of Christ, for Jesus, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and for your love for us, Father. We are children of God. We are your children. I pray that, again that you would fill us with a great and extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit this morning and throughout this day <clears throat> and throughout this coming week, Lord. I pray that you would blossom in our lives the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, patience, joy, goodness, kindness. I pray that you would, again, fill us with the gifts of the Spirit and that we would fan into flame the gifts that you have already given us. I pray that you would teach us to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit continually, Lord. I pray that you would teach us to pray in the Spirit at all times. And this morning, we ask that you would, through your Spirit, worship through us, that we might worship in spirit and in truth, Lord. Thank you for your presence with us, Lord. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you promise that you are with us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We give you praise, Father, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We start with two songs this morning for our worship. The first is Forever, a well-known song that we've sung, and then also a modern hymn called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's worship. Love endures forever 
love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory On his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I Boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Well, welcome again. It's really nice to have you. I looked over and saw more people joining us. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to worship with us, to hear scripture read, and to hear a text expounded. Again, we read from Luke chapter 14, 25 through 33. This is, will be the last time I read it. We are concluding our study of the, of the, of the discipleship of grace. 
And I hope you've come to understand these verses. Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. Now large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will uh, begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to finish and was to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. So we saw three requirements for being a disciple of Christ in this text. But it was spoken to the crowds who were following Jesus. And Jesus happens to be on his way to the cross now, to Jerusalem to die. And so the first call to hate your family was really the call to love God with everything you got, only said in reverse, in relation to your love of God, hate your family. Secondly, you had to take up your cross and follow Jesus to Jerusalem. It was a literal instrument of execution spoken to the crowds who were wanting, were wanting to follow Jesus to make him a overthrower, overthrower of the Roman Empire and to make him into a Messiah after their own image, after their own expectations. And so that one is impossible for us because we weren't in that crowd. Jesus has already gone to Jerusalem. He's died. And then lastly, to sell all, all of your possessions. The idea was to give it away. Spoken elsewhere, give all your possessions and give to the poor, which was essentially the command, love your neighbor as yourself. So this command to follow Jesus has the high call of the law, the heart of the law boiled down to its essential matter, love God with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and so on, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is exemplified in Jesus' commands to the crowds. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, of his word this morning. We have a, a number of uh, prayers to pray this morning. We're very grateful that a certain individual is home. He's joining us today, but I'm, I'm very glad his kids, kids are glad. And I'm very grateful for the good report that Nancy and, and I received this week. Undetectable PSA, normal labs, cholesterol down from 272 to 214. I do have osteopenia, but that's expected for, as a side effect from this medication. So they're going to be monitor, monitoring that for me. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, thank you for everyone gathered. I thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you for this time that we have to spend together, albeit over Facebook, but it's still time together, worshiping, getting the word out, being about the ministry and work of Christ in and through our lives. I look at this tired old world, Lord, so full of sin and rebellion and deception and lies. And you, you look down on us and you love us with a love incomprehensible, Lord. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In this is love. And so, Father, again, we pray that your love would be manifest to the world, that you would convict the world of its sin. I pray that you would bring about a great awakening by a, a great outpouring of your spirit around the globe and in our nation, in our state, in our counties, in our cities, here in Bremerton, in Port Orchard, in Silverdale, 
and Belfair and Allen and Paulsbo and Manchester and Gorst. Father, we've tried. We've tried to generate a revival by our effort, by our programming, but nothing can take the place of your Holy Spirit. So, Father, with one voice, we plead, we beg you that you would send out, impel, propel out workers into the harvest, Lord. That you would propel us out into the harvest. Father, I know that a lot of us are troubled by many things. Some of us are rejoicing, some of us are mourning, some of us are worried, Lord, by many things. So again, Lord, you be our burden bearer. You take our worries and our concerns and our fears and you turn them into the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a couple of announcements to go over. Our leadership team meeting uh, is scheduled for this Tuesday, March 2nd. We'll be beginning at 6.30 p.m. with the room on Zoom opening at 6 p.m. And also just a reminder to the auditors, uh, you may audit the books anytime now. Just call Joe Nimala and he'll, he'll get the books to you from 2020. Our Covenant Group Bible Study will meet this Thursday, March 4th, beginning at 7 p.m. with the Zoom room opening up at 6.30 p.m. We'd love to have you join. We're working through the Gos or through Galatians. And we're just into the first chapter, just a little bit beyond the introduction now. It's never too, lo too late to join. Our women's Bible study, led by my wife Nancy, will resume on this coming Saturday, March 6th at 3.30 p.m. With the, with the room opening up on Zoom at 3 p.m. She'd love to have you join, and it's never too late to join. And lastly, contributions may be sent to the church at 1211 Venita Avenue, Bremerton, Washington, 98337. Well, again, welcome. Our daughter Sarah got moved into her house along with Nicole yesterday. The furniture was moved in, so now they're out of their apartment and living in their new home. It's going to be a gradual process, but we're very excited for them. Before we begin our message, let's, let's again pray. Father, I just pray that you'd be my voice. That the Holy Spirit would give me words that you would fill me with an extraordinary and great measure of your Holy Spirit this morning and throughout this day and week, and all of us, Lord, that you would fill all of us with that extraordinary and great measure of your Spirit. I pray that you would guide my thoughts, my words, you would keep me on track and according to your purpose and grace. I pray that you would help me to enunciate clearly I pray that you would bring me to say everything that you would have me to say and keep me from saying the things I don't. I pray that you draw illustrations to mine. I pray now that you would come and speak through me, Lord. I pray that you would speak a word of power and grace and truth in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're concluding our look at the Discipleship of Grace this week. Next week is Communion Sunday. Forgot to announce that, so if you could prepare for that, we'll be having Communion. And we'll be returning to our study of Isaiah 53, the Song of the Suffering Servant. And we'll be looking, I think, at verse 8. And then the following week, I'll be re returning to the Gospel of John and continuing our study of John. We took a break for the holidays and for our vacation. And I got started on this Discipleship of Grace series and so we'll, we'll conclude it today. So today I'm looking at Galatians chapter 5. I think it's one of the most helpful passages to understanding the authentic Christian life. Of course the whole book of Galatians is. It spells out clearly the difference between a life of faith lived out of the power of the Spirit and of a life of works lived out of our own self-effort and our own flesh. 
The former is the only possible way we can live and to be perfected by the Spirit. The latter only results in continued failure, failure continued sin, and even leads to pride and self-righteousness and a whole host of other sins. So let's begin with Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So throughout the, the epistle of the Galatians, Paul has been contrasting life in the spirit with life under the law, the Mosaic law, the covenant of law that was entered into by circumcision. And so we know when it says it was for, cre uh, for freedom that Christ has set us free, he is referring to freedom from the law. Also along with freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from the power of the enemy, from the devil. But primarily this is freedom from living under the strict rules of the law. Is there something wrong with the law? Of course not. It's perfect, righteous, holy, and good. The, the trouble is it's is with us. We're the ones that have this flesh that won't quit. Flesh thinks it's conquered flesh and all it amounts to is pride and spinning out more and more sin, more and more degradation, more and more failure. So it was for freedom Christ has set us free. Think about that. In Christ we are free. I think the words from 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, the oft-quoted words, um, for the Lord is a spirit, and, a sp and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And what we all with unveiled face as beholding the glory of the Lord are being changed from one degree of glory to another into his likeness. For this comes from the Lord who is a spirit. That transformation comes from the Lord who is a spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we have law set against life in the spirit. Law brings bondage. The spirit brings freedom. It was for freedom that, that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of sl slavery. Stand firm in the gospel. Stand firm in the grace of Jesus Christ. Stand firm in the continued work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. These are strong words. Therefore, keep standing, continue to stand in what Christ is doing in your life, in his grace. In that freedom, keep standing in freedom. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. When I read that yoke of slavery, I can't help but think of the, the passage we saw several weeks ago in Acts at the Jerusalem Council. They've had debate on whether they had to be circumcised, which is much of the debate in Galatians too against that perspective. Circumcision was the right that brought you into keeping the law, and if you were circumcised to bring you under the law, then you had to keep the entirety of it. We'll see that in a minute. But Acts 15, 7 through 9, actually 7 through 11, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's the account of Cornelius and the Gentile inclusion, the Gentile Pentecost, found in, in Acts chapter 10. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did, as he also did to us. So we saw the Holy Spirit given to Cornelius. We fall, saw the, the evidence of that, of that Spirit falling on, on them in the gift of tongues at that time. That's not a necessarily requirement of of receiving the Holy Spirit as some would have it. But we saw them receive the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us on the day of Pentecost. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. And so this freedom we have in Christ is accessed through trusting Jesus, through tr trusting the Father, through trusting the Holy Spirit. Faith, belief, Trust, all the same words in the original language of the New Testament. We continue in verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? The whole context of 
that Jerusalem council was whether the Antiochians, the Gentiles, had to be circumcised and come under the, keeping the entirety of the law. And the pronouncement was, no, they did not have to be circumcised, therefore not putting themselves under the law. Of course, James had that kind of uh, working out the, the differences in culture between a Jewish culture and a Gentile culture. So he gave them some guidelines so that they wouldn't offend the Jewish people. But that wasn't about justification. That was about keeping the peace between these two groups. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. And Peter is saying, why are you putting God to the test? Why are you testing God by requiring these Gentiles to go back under the yoke of the law? That's what's being referred to which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. No one has been able to bear the yoke of the law. Then there's the yoke of Jesus' grace. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, the yoke of my grace, we understand from the early church. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when... Paul says it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He's talking about circumcision and come, coming under the entire, entirety of the law. So it seems funny that we are free from the law, from its strict rules and its strict demands. Because with law comes cursing and blessing. If you keep it in its entirety, you are blessed. If you break it, even at one point will be seen, you've broken the whole thing and you are under a curse. You are under judgment. You are under the sentence of the law, which is death, the condemnation of the law, death. We move on and it says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. So uh, again, we're in the same account, that same kind of storyline of the Antioch church, that there was these Judaizers who were demanding the Galatians now to be circumcised, put themselves under the law. So it's grace plus circumcision and the law. Grace plus the rules of the law. And we might add grace plus all the rules of our own making, our, our church rules. But get this, if, if we, if they sought circumcision as a means of perfecting their lives, as a, as a means of being kept, saved by grace, now kept by the law, Paul says, resolutely, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You've lost the benefit that comes from Christ. His power, His grace, the gift of the Spirit. We, we literally make them ineffectual in our lives by putting ourselves under some form of law. Because the entirety of that transformation in our life comes from the Holy Spirit and His work. We are being changed into a, to his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Galatians 5.3, And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law, not just part of it. So if you're seeking grace plus, plus circumcision, because we want to be made right with God through both, we want to cover all of our bases, then you're under obligation to keep the entirety of the law, even the threefold division that was come up by, that was created by Thomas Aquinas, I believe, in the 13th century of the ritual, ceremonial, and moral law. No, you got to keep. There was no such division in in the law or in the Gospels. That was a, a later creation. It's a commandment and teaching of men. You are under obligation to keep the entire thing. And James tells us in in James 2:10. For whoever keeps the whole law, if you're able to keep the whole, whole law, and yet stumbles in just one point, he has become guilty of all. She has be, become guilty of all. How many of us can stand? None of us save Jesus except Jesus. So this idea that we should be putting ourselves under some form of the law, whether it's keeping the feasts, whether it's making sure that we are keeping Sabbath in order to be 
to find justification and acceptance with God, whether it is the tithe, strictly the tithe, we give out of a generous heart led by the Holy Spirit, whether it is even the Ten Commandments, and people will, will respond with almost anger at me because I say that, but you know, we actually lost a, a person from our church many years ago because I said that we are no longer under the Ten Commandments when we preached on, when I preached on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, contrasting the ministry of the Spirit which gives life with the ministry of death engraved with letters on stone, the Ten Commandments. It's clear what, what they're talking about. The ministry of death. All, it, all the law can do is condemn you to death. And so there's, there's no ability to say, well, I'm going to be saved by grace. Now I'm going to put myself just under this one little piece of the law, whether it's circumcision, whether it's the moral law. We have moral standard. Please don't mishear me. This isn't a license to go out and sin freely. Galatians chapter 5 tells us how we can live apart from the law, but in the Spirit. Moving on to verse 4. You've been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So they're seeking, we're justified by grace through faith, initially we're saved. Now we are kept, we are justified continually by keeping the law. And so it's this twofold gospel, grace and law. And notice the language he uses, it's kind of shocking. You've been severed from Christ. They're talking about circumcision here. And so if you go back and get yourself circ circumcised, that little bit of the foreskin cut off, you are severing yourself from Christ. In doing that, you cut off yourself from Christ, meaning from his power, from his grace, from the Holy Spirit. You who are seeking to be justified, acquitted by the law, you have fallen from grace. So to put, put ourselves under circumcision, or for that matter, any part of the law, and to live by those just pieces of the law, a lot of people do that. Well, you don't have to live under the law except for this piece. What James was doing in Acts 15 wasn't telling them to live under the law. They pronounced they don't have to be circumcised, which to the Jew meant they didn't have to live under the law. But for practical purpose, for keeping the peace, he gave them some guidelines, which we see later at least one of them was further expounded upon by Paul and in a sense overturned. I, I grew up hearing that if you sin too much, you would fall from the church. You would, you would backslide right out of the church and into hell. But get this, when we are in the legalism, just like that day and the legalism of this day and our day, and even the perfect, righteous, holy, and good law, if we try to put ourselves under it, we have fallen from grace. We have been cut off, emasculated from Christ. Shocking language. It makes us men a little bit uh, queasy. Moving right along. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, there is that faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. So we are not looking to ourselves for righteousness. We are waiting. It's been already given to us in its fullness. And yet there's this now not yetness to faith and to righteousness. I'm not fully righteous and neither are you. You know that about me. I know that about you. One day we will be face to face with him and we will be like him. And we will be righteous. No more sin. No more struggle. No more flesh. No more self-effort. Everything will be of God. Everything will be of his power. And our faith will be replaced with sight. But for now, through the Spirit, by faith, through, so through the Spirit's work in our life, by faith, we are waiting for the hope of righteous, righteousness to come. We are growing in it, but I don't think we will be fully there until we are set foot in, in ethereal air, set foot in heaven. Continuing in verse 6, For in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. 
So if you get circumcised, it doesn't mean anything. If you remain uncircumcised, it doesn't mean anything. Really. He's not recommending getting circumcised. He's just saying there's no benefit to it. But what there is benefit to is faith and working through love. We have so spiritualized the word faith that we lose sight of what it really means. We have made it a religious term, but it just meant trust. But belief working through love. But trust working through love. But faith working through love. So faith always has an object from outside of itself. And that object is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, three in one in the mystery of the Trinity. It's God. It's never faith in faith. It's never faith in our own ability to do the right things. It's always faith in in the only true object, which is God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's faith working through love. I, I read this morning in a commentary in Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, it's called JFB. Um, it says, Greek, faith which works by love, is literally working faith working by love. And it, it, the sentence effectually means, or uh, expresses, which effectually worketh, which exhibits its energy by love. And so faith effectually works by love. And we think, well, here we're back to, I better be loving. No, because at the end of the chapter, we'll see where this love comes from. And it's entirely a fruit or th part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit, but one fruit, which has different segments, love, peace, patience, joy, kindness but faith working through love. And he's getting at that the whole entirety of the law can be summed up in one word, love. You know, love the Lord your, your God with all your strength, with all your might, with all your soul, and with all your, I get them mixed up, but with all your uh, soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And so love isn't added into faith as part of our justification. Rather, faith working by love. Love is a result of our having trust in the Holy Spirit. Then he produces love in us. And that works effectually, very powerfully in our lives. I know that love c covers a multitude of sin. I used to, when Mormons would come, I would quote them, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if I, or, or even if we, or an angel from heaven, should proclaim to you, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which you receive, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary Contrary to that which we preach, let him be accursed, let him be uh, doomed to destruction, is what that word means. And so this week, I, I, some Mormon gals came to the door, and I was actually in a seminar on evangelism led by Dr. Beth Severson of our covenant. She's the one who led our evangelism cohort a couple years ago, and, and they came to the door, and Nancy answered it, and so I stopped and turned, you know, I was muted, and so I went over and talked to them. And Frank Tyler has suggested a different way of responding to them. Instead of responding to them with that warning that even if an angel, Moroni, should, should appear, and that you are under this, uh, this curse, doomed to destruction because of what you're doing, he suggested, and, and I heard the Holy Spirit through him, you know, just shower them with love. And so I just reminded them of how much God loves them. And, I, took, uh, and it, I, I can't explain it. The Holy Spirit just poured himself in and through me. This great love for these two women who are lost. They're lost. And they need to be found. And I think the approach, I could tell they were both rattled to the core of their being because I shared my testimony. I shared what the power of Christ has done in my life, that I know Jesus intimately. Share John 5.24, Galatians 2.20. This just kept coming to mind, the Holy Spirit working in and through me. And faith working by love. The love that Jesus has poured out in my hearts. In my flesh, I get angry. They're destroying people's lives by what they're doing. 
But Jesus loves, loves these two women. So you can pray for them. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. And I can't help but think of the passage in 1 John 3.23. This is his commandment, God's commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Faith, there's the faith. And love one another just as he commanded us. There's the, the command to love one another as he commanded us. Love one another as I have loved you. And that's an impossibility because he loved us through giving himself up for us on the cross. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Faith working through love. We continue. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And obeying the truth means believing the truth. We've seen that many times. And so it's apprehending the gospel, the gospel of grace in all of its truth, and then believing it. And that's obeying the truth. Who hindered you? You were running so well. You were doing so well as a church. And suddenly you've gotten completely off track. You've gotten deceived. Who hindered you? Who put, a, put, put up a stumbling block for you? It goes on and says, This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the cr grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, a gospel of grace plus works, a gospel of grace plus law. And get this, this persuasion did not come from God. It didn't come from Jesus. He goes on and he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. And so he's warning them of this leaven. He warned them of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes, the commandments and teachings of men, which he defines what the leaven is. And this leaven now is the works of the law, bringing us back under it. You can't love under, live under two covenants, and you can't love under two covenants either. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I saw this firsthand when I worked at Vandy Camp Dutch Bakery. I've told this illustration before, but there would be a 55-gallon drum, and I'd be cleaning up the bread area, and dough would drop out of the machine that was letting it rise after it had been put in the pans. And that sheeter that split up the pieces of or the big chunk of dough into little pieces that then dropped into the pans, they would sometimes drop out on the floor. And so as I went and cleaned up the area, I would do my basketball shot into the 55-gallon uh, drum, and they would be filling it all day. And so... By the time I would come in, actually, uh, I would continue to do that after I came back. But when I came, that 55-gallon drum had taken on a life its, of its own, and that dough had fallen all over the sides and covered up even the, the little dolly that it sat on. And so it just looked like this monster. Then I would punch that all back down in, put it in, and I would take it down to the dumpster and, and dump it in. And then they had a big hydraulic press, which would press it into this very large dumpster. But that dough would then continue to expand because of the yeast, because of the leaven within it. So this is the closest picture I could get to it. But here's a dumpster behind a pizza restaurant. I think it's in England. And they filled the, the dumpster with dough. And now it looks like a living thing, a monster coming out of the dumpster. And what he's getting at is just a little bit of this legalism just a little bit of that grace plus law, even circumcision, even the Ten Commandments, even whatever part of the law you want to add on, or all the fence rules of the Pharisees, or all the fence rules of us for what makes a good Christian, apart from life in the Spirit. It can infect the entire lump of dough, which is now we're getting at the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the churches in Galatia, the church in the, the Galatians had let this little bit of lie come in, and now it's leveling, uh, leavening the whole church. It's corrupting it. And I, I love this picture because it's, it's not something you want to eat. I don't want to take that and put it on a pan and put uh, tomato sauce on it. It's, it's only good for the garbage dump. And in a sense, when we take the gospel of grace and add some part of the law or 
our own laws back into it, that can infect the entire body. It can deceive an entire body. I've witnessed this over and over again in my life. I grew up in churches that had been leavened by the grace plus law message. It's a corrupting influence. And it's a, a stern warning to us to examine our own lives and to ask, where am I putting myself back under the law or back under the rules of, of our own making? Because if the law, holy, righteous, and good, cannot bring us to a, a righteous life, but can only show us like a shaving mirror how in need we are of a bath or getting cleaned up, and it can only condemn us to death because we failed to keep it, how much less is the rules of our own making? How are they going to be able to do anything that is substantially effective for our lives? No, it's all produced by the flesh, always en ending up in pride and self-righteousness. He said to the Pharisees, You are whitewashed tombs, full of dead men's bone, bones, full of corruption and rot. And co what do corpses do? They not disintegrate. They, oh, my word recall here. Nancy can't remember it either. Decompose. They're full of decomposed flesh. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in, in, in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. You've already gotten a, off, off mark. You've gotten off the right path. You've gone astray. You've been deceived. But Paul had confidence in them, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, that they will return to the heart of the gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. The one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. And that judgment is spoken of in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I've already quoted them. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So the gospel is about the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort or pervert the gospel of Christ, which is the grace of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, Michael, Gabriel, Moroni, whoever it is, but even if we or an angel from heaven, even if one of the apostles, we would be one of the apostles, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, he is to be accursed. And that means to be doomed to destruction. Permanently doomed to destruction. As we have said before, so I Say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to, the, to what you received, he is to be accursed. He is to be doomed to destruction eternally. That's the sense of it. Wow. We ministers have a greater responsibility that we don't deceive people by preaching grace plus a little wee bit of the law the leaven of the law, or the leaven of the rules and commandments of our own making. We love this stuff. We love creating these rules. We love propounding these rules. We, live, we love trying to live by these rules. And so we find a certain set that works for us that we can keep. And then we feel good about ourselves because we're living the right kind of life. And get this. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. And what is that judgment? To be accursed. And Paul has said it twice, emphasizing that it's a settled, a settled issue that if somebody is perverting the gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, turning it into gospel plus law, he is to be doomed to destruction. He is to come under a curse. Wow. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. And he's what he's saying is, I don't preach circumcision. I don't preach keeping the law. Why am I being persecuted? Because I am preaching that you're not under the law, that you 
are not to be circumcised. If he was doing that, he's giving this unreal hypothetical case. If he was doing that, then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. And the cross is a stumbling block because it says it's entirely up to what Jesus did on the cross. It's entirely up to what the Spirit is doing now in his perfecting your and my life. And so it sounds like we can go out and sin freely that may, grace may abound. It's a stumbling block that, in the sense that I can accept the, the forgiveness wrought on the cross for me, fashioned on the cross for me, but when that other person, the level three sex offender, or the prostitute, or the murderer, or the serial killer, whoever it is, when they're forgiven by the cross, it becomes a stumbling block for people then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished if you're still uh, preaching circumcision, which Paul says, I'm not doing that. I'm not preaching circumcision. And the reason why he's being persecuted, and he's being persecuted by the Judaizers and by the Gentiles, but mainly by the Judaizers who were causing him so much problems. If he was preaching circus circumcision, circumcision, he would not be persecuted. And the stumbling of the cross would have been abolished. There had been no need of the cross. It would have been destroyed by preaching circumcision is what he's getting at. So grace is destroyed by preaching law. And it's not just circumcision. It's any part of the law. If you decide that we have to live by our own effort under the Ten Commandments, you're abolishing the cross. You're abolishing grace. Paul's language is extremely strong here. And yet, I see people and ministers doing this all the time. And I grieve. I, I grieve for them because there's a veil, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that lies on, over their eyes. And in chapter 4, it says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Well, it's, he's also blinded the minds of those who would preach grace plus a little bit of the law. A little bit of the leaven of the law. Verse 12, I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. The New American Standard Bible has made this a little bit nicer. Others versions, versions read, would emasculate themselves. That's not quite as nice. I like this version, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. The new one, the update to this, the Christian Standard Bible, again uses mutilate. They don't want that harsh language, but Paul is using this in incredibly graphic language. He says, I wish those who, were, who are disturbing you might also get themselves castrated. If they're going to cut the foreskin off, cut the whole thing off. Go all the way. Wow. Strong language to say how deadly this leaven is, how deadly this message is, saved by grace, kept by the law. No, the message of Galatians is saved by grace, kept and perfected by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. We move on to Galatians 5.13. For you were called the freedom, brethren. For freedom Christ has set us free. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity, to, opportunity for the flesh. There's that charge that was made against Paul everywhere he went, that by preaching grace, he was giving people a license to sin. In their freedom, people could choose to sin. But what he was saying is, do not turn that freedom in, into an opportunity for your flesh, for that corruption that dwells within us, or that corruption of who we are in of ourselves. So again, to that answer, shall I sin that grace may abound? Paul's resolute and strong answer is, may it never be. Are you daft? Are you out of your mind? But through love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. And so instead of using our freedom to 
do whatever we want and sin freely, Paul's admonishing the Galatians to use their freedom to serve one another through love. And again, it's not love produced by one's own flesh, because at the end of the chapter, he tells us where this love's, love comes from. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience. So the first segment of that fruit is love. In John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, uh, she who abides in me and I in her, she it is that bears much fruit, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And the whole chapter is about the commandment of love, loving one another as I have loved you. And Jesus says to us clearly, for you, it is impossible. You cannot do it without me. For apart from me, me, you can do nothing. For apart from me, you can't even love. And so he says, use your freedom as an opportunity to love each other and serve each other, serving each other in love. So we are free to love. Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So if you boil the law down to its two essential matters, you get love God with everything you've got and, you, and love your neighbor as yourself. But here Paul says you can boil it down to just word, one word and it doesn't mean one single word, but one phrase. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So they were wanting to get circumcised, come under the law, put themselves under the law, which would have included loving your neighbor as yourself. We see it uh, expounded in Matthew 22, verses 34, 35 through 40. One of them, a lawyer, one of the scribes, experts in knowing the law. They knew every jot and tittle of the law. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, again, putting him on trial. Teacher, what, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. On these two commandments hang the whole law and prophets. So if you boil the law down to its essential matter, it's love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. And when Paul says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that's implying the first one. It's not to tossing it out. It's saying, if you love God with everything you've got, then you are going to be loving your neighbor as yourself. My point in bringing up Matthew is that it's still law. These two commandments you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. It is the law boiled down to its essential matter. It is the heart of the law and it is part of the Mosaic law. So if, if you put yourself grace plus this commandment, what are you doing? You're mixing law and grace. Do you mean that I don't have to love with all my strength? Well, you're unable to. That's the point. You are completely unable to. I am completely unable to. If we're at all honest with each other, this is the, the counterpart of hating your family. If anyone does not hate his own father and mother and sister and brother and children and even his own life for my sake, he cannot be my disciple. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the heart of the law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Go and sell all of your possessions, which means you don't keep the money, you give it away. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So these Galatians want to be circumcised, bringing them under the entirety of the law, bringing themselves under these two commandments. Look what happens. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not also consumed by one another. So the reality is they're saying they want to put themselves under the law. They say they want to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. And they want to not love their neighbor as themselves. So they put themselves under that grace plus keeping these commandments. But look at what the reality of their lives are. Paul says, but if you bite and devour one another, one another, which means that this is exactly what they're doing. Because if you try to live under those, those two commandments and living under the law, living under circ circumcision, even if you're not circumcised and you put yourself under those commandments, you're going to end up biting and devouring one another because it is impossible for you 
We have believed the lie that we can be as God, that we can produce a righteousness of our own making. Take care that you are not consumed by one another. If you bite and de devour, you start feeding on each other, and then you end up eating each other all up. Churches do this. Legalistic churches split. They split. They split. They split. Because they're dependent on themselves. Moving on. But I say, now in contrast to living under those two commandments, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So now we see the real problem is the desires of our flesh, of our self-life. I like what um, Malcolm Smith, Smith does with that word. He says, you want to understand flesh? Take off the S, the H and spell it backwards. It spells self. Well, that's only in the English language, but it's life lived out of self-effort. Life lived out of your own resources. You on the throne, you as God. Out of your ability, your actions. But if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And what is he indicating the desire of the flesh is? Devouring one another, biting one another, and all manner of sin. We move on to verse 17. One of the most profound verses in this passage. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. So if you're living under the, the, the law by your flesh, it's no problem with the law, but if you're living under the law by your flesh, you are setting your desire against the Spirit. And the Spirit's desires against the flesh are set against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. And the word please there is a word from which can mean desire, uh, a wish, or it can mean will, what you will so that you will may not do the things that you will. We have separated desire from our choice as if our choices are made up free of our emotions and our, our wishes and our desires. But more often than not, our, our desires are influenced by our choices, by what we want, by what we desire. And so this verse really co comes to the heart of the matter my flesh, your flesh, your self-life, lived out of self-effort, is in its its desires are set against what the spirit desires for your, for your life, and what the spirit desires for your life is in opposition to what your flesh is. So they're in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So the Holy Spirit comes in as a restraining influence on our life, keeping our flesh at bay. And if you're trying to live under the law, you're not living by the Spirit. You're not going to be having that restraining influence of the Holy Spirit that keeps your, your flesh in check. Then you're going to be doing the things that you please. You're going to be going out there. So if you're trying to put yourself under love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, you're putting yourself under one piece of the law. You are severed from Christ you have made the, thing, the, the things of Christ in, ineffectual and inoperable in your life, including the work of the Holy Spirit, and you are con going to produce the things that you please, that you desire, that you want to do, that you choose to do. And what are those things? Well, we'll get there in verse 19. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not, uh, not under the law. So the whole point of Galatians is to get people to live a life of grace by being led of the Spirit by learning to follow the Spirit's promptings, by looking to, to the Spirit for life, for that transformation in my life. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed, transformed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Galatians let me get there in my Bible here. Galatians. Well, it's coming up. There we go. Where is Galatians here? Galatians 3, 1. And we read this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. 
Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Hearing with faith. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the Spirit? If you go over to the NIV, the, the 1984 version, it says, are you now being perfected by your self-effort? So you, what this is saying is, if you're led by the Spirit, you're, you're not under the law. If you're under the law, conversely, if you're under the law, you cannot be led by the Spirit. You've been severed from Christ. You've been severed from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And how often we, we love to pile these rules on ourselves, either some part of the law or our fence rules around it or our own church rules. And when we do that, we miss out on what the Holy Spirit could be doing in our life. And now we get to this, the rub of this. Oh, let me get to Romans 8, 5 through 9. But if we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. Romans 8, 5 through 9 explains this very clearly. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So if you're living by your self-effort, by your flesh, if you've put yourself under some part of the law, even the heart of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you've set your mind on the things of the flesh because it's by your self-effort that those things that the law has to be accomplished. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for the mind set on the flesh is death, because all the law can do is condemn us to death. Our flesh will never achieve the law. Remember, you have to keep the entirety of it. But the mind set on, on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So we think, we, we believe this lie that I can somehow li be saved by grace, now it's up to me to be kept by the law, to be perfected by my self-effort, to be perfected by the law. And Paul says this astounding things that our flesh, our self-effort, our self-lives, they're not even able to, to do so. We're not able to follow the dictates of the law. For it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The only way we can please God is by being under the control and operation and effectual working of the Holy Spirit. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. <laughs> You're not in the flesh, and so why do we live according to the flesh? But in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So we're talking about being born of the Spirit here, being filled with the Spirit at our birth, at our new birth. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are, you are not, not under the law. So Paul is clearly saying there's three way, or two ways to live. Not three, two ways to live. We either are led of the Spirit or we are under the law. And under the law, we cannot please God. We're not even able to follow the dictates of the law. All we do is produce corruption. And then he gets into what corruption will be produced. Galatians 5.19, now the deeds of the fl flesh, and literally it's the works of the flesh. So if you live under the works of the law, you're going to be producing the wages of, of the flesh, which is death, but you're going to be producing the works of, of the flesh. Works of the law lead to work, trying to do the works of the law lead to doing the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, uh, evident which are immorality, which is a sexual term, se sexual immorality, and it's a broad term, covering all kinds of different kinds of sexual immorality. Impurity, sensuality, all terms related to sexual sin. Idolatry, making things into idols. Sorcery, which is linked to uh, pharmakeia, which is drugs, so using drugs for altered uh, spiritual experience, like I did in, in college with LSD. Enmities, being at enmity with somebody, being in conflict with people. Strife, again, another word of conflict. Jealousy, outbursts of anger. That was my dad, outbursts of anger. Disputes, dissensions, factions. You hear the division in, in this? So if you live by the law, if you live under the law, what, and you live, live by legalism, you're going to end up being a divisive person. You're going to end up having sexual sin in your life. You're going to end up being an idolater, probably of your self-life, will be your idol. You'll be in jealousy of those who look better than you. You'll be someone prone to outbursts of anger. 
Envying, I love this word, it means outbursts of selfishness. Have you ever had an outburst of selfishness? Yes, I have. And it's not pretty. An outburst of selfishness where I just want it to be about me. I don't care about other people. I just want it to be about me. An outburst of selfishness. Drunkenness. Well, I know that one. Carousing, which is parting. Uh, parting with a bunch of people, getting drunk. And things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I've practiced such things. No, that was the old Grant. That was the old you. We've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live. We're, we're dead people. But what he's getting at, they want to put themselves under circumcision and under the law to be kept by the law, to be perfected by the law. But he says, if you do that, this is the list of things that you're going to be creating in your life. And if you do that, you're not going to be living under grace. You're not going to be, and you will en end up not inheriting the kingdom of God. You won't in inherit the rule of God in your life. I don't believe that this is saying if, if you are truly have come to Christ, you're going to lose your salvation. But if they are pre preaching this as the gospel, you're not preaching life, you're preaching death. And by this gospel, no one is going to get saved. You're saved by the grace of Christ and perfected by the grace of Christ. So they want to live under the law. They want to put themselves under love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And as a result of doing that, they're biting each other, backbiting each other, devouring each other. And they then, by necessity, because the desires of the flesh are opposed to the spirit, and if you kick out the spirit by going back under the, the law, even the heart of the law, then you produce the works of the law, and that's this whole list of horrendous things. Legalistic people can sometimes be the meanest people. They wear masks. They, they look great on the outside, but on the inside, they're full of all of this stuff. Wherever you find legalism, you're going to find lots of sin under the covers, pun intended. And then we have this huge contrast to living under even the heart of the law. But the fruit of the Spirit the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the Spirit produces, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Don't you long to be loving and full of joy, at peace with yourself and with other people, patient with everyone, kind to everyone, full of goodness, faithfulness, being full of faith, gentleness, and living a self-controlled life. It does not come, self-control does not come out of self-controlling self. It comes as, as a fruit of the Spirit. This should be an, a text that awakens our understanding because we're right back to we cannot produce love out of our flesh. We will produce biting and devouring one another if we try to love the Lord our God with all of our strength, with all of our soul and with all of our, our mind, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And if we try to love our neighbor as ourself, out of self, instead we'll devour one another, we'll produce that list of horrendous sins. But the fruit of the Spirit, what he produces in us. Do you need patience? I've heard people, I'm going to work on patience this week, and I, th I think, good luck. Good luck with that. You're going to need it because you're going to not get done with this day before you've lost all patience. You can't produce joy in your life. We try to produce joy by buying the right things, by um, filling our lives with things and, and food and clothing and shoes and whatever it might be, fishing tackle, and I'm stepping on some of your toes here, sewing material, uh, we're getting a little close to home, computer software, that's my, my, my addiction, my hobby. Now, as we come under the Holy Spirit's direction and leading, then he produces love, joy. He produces joy. He produces peace. Not a peace that I can manu manufacture. He produces patience in me. So I'm lacking patience. I don't say, Lord, give me patience. I say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit and let me 
learn better how to walk in your spirit and to be led of your spirit. May you produce the fruit of the spirit in my life. You can pray the same thing. Father, produce the fruit of the spirit in my life. Don't you like to be around people who are kind? Goodness, that there's no nothing false about them. There's nothing perverted about them. They're just full of goodness. Faithfulness, they're full of trusting God. Gentle people and self-controlled people. They know how to control their tongue. They know how to control their actions. They don't lift the finger to that driver who cuts them off. Against such things there is no law. He's posing two ways of living. Under the law or some part of the law, whichever part you want to throw in, or life lived out by grace through the power of the Spirit and through the perfecting, transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ have crucified with the flesh with its passions. We again turn to Romans 8 to have this explained. How have we crucified the flesh with its passions? Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions. We put it to death. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Romans 8 verse 12 reads, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, but if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body. Remember the story, I, I've been an aggressive driver. I considered I was a good driver. But I've been an aggressive driver in my life. And last year I prayed, Lord, put this to death in me. And he did. Not by how I wanted him to do it, but I asked the Holy Spirit to put to death in me that, that sin. And he did. And I continually pray that he will put to death in me other things. Put to death in me my pride. Put to death in me my arrogance. And so on and so on. We can ask the Holy Spirit to put things to death in the body. We've crucified the flesh by giving it to the Spirit to put to death. You must die, but if, you, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the whole key is to get led by the Spirit. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you, you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. We have been adopted by God, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and it comes about by letting the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh by asking him to. I'm not adding in that asking him to. I don't know how else to, to get there. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, and so we ask the Holy Spirit to do this. Galatians 5.25, here's the heart of the passage. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit is getting at John chapter 3, getting at that truth in John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, he probably didn't want to be seen, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is coming to tell him that he thinks he's the real deal, and Jesus says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Kind of a shocking statement. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He takes him literally. He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, if we live by the Spirit and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is, is flesh. That's the water birth. Our mother's water broke and then we're born. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. So if we live by the Spirit, we're born of the Spirit because we believed in Jesus. Let us also walk by the Spirit. Live by the effectual power of the Spirit. It's 
the Christian life is not lived by something within you. The Christian life is lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Of course, he comes to dwell within you, but what I mean by within you, within your own self. Let us also walk by the Spirit. Everywhere they went in that day, they walked so it became synonymous with living. Let us also live by the Spirit. So have, there's this contrast in Galatians 5. You either live by the Spirit or you live under the law. There's no such thing as living by grace and then adulterating it with some part of the law, whether it's circumcision, whether it's the heart of the law, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind and with all of your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Even if you try to live under that, you've severed yourself from Christ, you've severed yourself from grace. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Sometimes people say that this is a uh, antinomian, antinomianism, anti-law. It's a special kind. They say it's an antinomianism of living life in the Spirit. I'm, I, and I'm thinking, isn't that what the text actually says? Isn't that what Galatians chapter 5 is so clearly expounding that you can't live by both? Either you live by grace under the power of the Spirit or you live by the law and by the power of your own self-effort, by the power of your flesh, and you will produce the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, envy, uh, jealousy, outbursts of anger, outbursts of selfishness, and so on. So we come back to verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Rather, continue to live out your life being led by the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, depending on Him for putting to death the deeds of the flesh, by depending on Him to be the power source of your life. And it's, it's achieved, it's, it's uh, enacted, it's empowered by simply trusting Jesus, by simply trusting the Holy Spirit. So I think it's important to be asking to be filled with the Spirit. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It doesn't have to become a legalism either. Well, we turn everything into legalism. So, well, then I must have to do this every morning, otherwise I, I, I'm... No. The Holy Spirit will let you know when to ask. There are certain times when I need Him frequently I need him. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery, including the, the heart of the law, love your God, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the heart of the law. We've been set free of that. We are to be under, living under entirely and wholly under the power of the Spirit. These are strong words. It was for freedom Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm in grace and in the work of His Spirit. And do not be subject again, again to a yoke of slavery. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. The best way I know how to get to living in the Spirit is about, not by reading a book, not by finding the seven steps to walking in the Spirit, or the 12 steps, or the 40 days of purpose, or whatever it is. The best way is simply to ask, this, ask God, will you teach me to walk in the Spirit and to be led of the Spirit, and then give me a willing heart? Will you teach me? Will you teach us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit and to be led of the Spirit? That the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, gentleness, self-control, might blossom in our lives. Amen. Well, that concludes our sermon today. We conclude with a song, Build My Life. It's essentially, Build My Life on Your Love.
Thank you again for joining me. Even in that song, it's not so much that we build our lives on his love, but he builds on our, our life in his love as we surrender to the Holy Spirit. It's either all spirit and all grace, or it's all law and all your self-effort. The one produces death. The one produces biting and devouring one another. But life lived in the Spirit, led of the Spirit, walking the Spirit, produces the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, peace patience, joy, goodness, kindness. Two ways to live. One leading to death, the other leading to life. Let's pray. Father, just I thank you for this morning. I thank you for Galatians 5 and for the whole book of Galatians, the whole letter of Galatians, Lord, how truthfully it proclaims the gospel of grace. So, Father, I pray that you would teach us to walk in the Spirit, to be led of the Spirit, that you would produce the fruit of the Spirit in each of our lives. Where we know we lack love, will you fill us with love? Will you fill us with joy? In the, even in the midst of our harsh realities, will you produce peace in us and gentleness and kindness and self-control? Father, I pray that you would do your good work in us. Take off the blinders that we have on our eyes. Take off the veil over our, 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 our sight. When we are living by either our own legalism, our own rules and commandments, or the rules and commandments of the church, or we have added some little bit of the law, leaven, which affects the whole dough, which affects the whole body. Help us then to realize the responsibility we have, not only to ourselves, but to the body to which we belong, not to walk in legalism, not to walk in grace plus law, but to walk entirely and holy by and through the Holy Spirit. Put our eyes of, of faith, put our eyes of trust on Jesus Christ, on the Father, and on the Holy Spirit. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that concludes our service today. It's good to see Randy and Terry. Hi, and also so many others. I, I glance at your names. It's really good to see you. Good to be with you this morning. You know, we'll be having our Bible study on Thursday on Zoom. Everyone is welcome. If you don't have the links, uh, contact me and I'll get, get you the links. And same with Nancy with the Women's Bible, Bible, on, Bible Study on Saturday. She'd love to have you join her. Our blessing is in from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.